around. Each of IVEX high and low views all the way around in this great circle and, and, and takes excellent measurements of the ENAs coming in in this circle. Okay, but that's not a sky map. We had to find a way with this small, cheap spacecraft to, to actually see all of the sky. And so we used something that we naturally had. We only have one side that has solar panels on it. And so what we do is we point that side towards the sun. And as the Earth goes around the sun, and let's run this next graphic, as the Earth goes around the sun, we keep repointing the spacecraft so it's pointing towards the sun. If you can roll this uh, movie, please. And as we repoint the spacecraft, the swath of the sky that you observe rotates around. And so you end up basically, over the course of half a year, by the spinning of the spacecraft and the repointing of the spacecraft, observing all directions in space. OK, so that's how we view these energetic neutral atoms, how we can see them coming from all directions in space. Um, I'd like to start the next movie. It, it shows IBEX in orbit around the Earth. IBEX is actually making these measurements from a, an Earth orbit. It's a very high altitude Earth orbit. We go almost all the way out to the moon, about 50 Earth radii, and then come back in. It takes about a week for IBEX to orbit around uh, the Earth and make a, and make a full, uh, full orbit. Um, over that week, we're at high altitude for most of the time, measuring these neutral particles, and then we come in close, we, we uh, downlink our data. Now, we're going to back away from this view, and as we back away from this view, you're going to see that that's the Earth. We're going to now see the orbits of, of Venus, of Mercury, the Sun itself, and you can see the direction of motion through the local interstellar medium. And painted in the backdrop, you can see the, these measurements that we've, that we've just made of, of, of the ribbon. So we're inside a sphere looking around in all directions and measuring these particles coming from all directions. If we back out of that sphere and see it from the outside, you can imagine taking a knife and cutting through that sphere and opening it up and flattening it out onto a, onto a page. And that's the sky map that you're seeing. And all of the observations we're going to talk about are in this format. So the nose is at the middle. That's the direction we're going through the galaxy. The tail is on the far right and left. North and south poles are, are, are where they are. So IBEX doesn't only measure um, particles at one energy, but actually measures particles over a broad range of energies, uh, from about 10 electron volts all the way up to 6,000 electron volts. And uh, this next uh, graphic that you're going to see is a, actually a set of five sky maps, not just one, but five sky maps at different energies. And they correspond to neutral hydrogen atoms coming in with speeds between half a million miles an hour and about two and a half million miles an hour. And what you see as we sort of go through, fade through the different energies, is that this ribbon changes and appears to get broader as you move away from one kilovolt, about a million mile an hour particles. Um, it's actually not getting broader. What's happening is it's, it's not, as, it's not as, uh, as bright compared to the background. And so you're sort of seeing the background, uh, the distributed flux from around there uh, coming up. There are a lot of really fascinating things in these, in these measurements. You can see in this one, for example, a bright spot up at, up at high latitudes on the left-hand side, um, which has a very different sort of a, a feature than, than much of the rest of the ribbon. So there's a lot of really great detailed information in, in these sky maps. Another thing that we scientists always want to do is we want to be able to confirm our results. And that's especially important when we find something that's not what we expected, that doesn't agree with theory, doesn't agree with model. How do you know you're right? How do you know that you can really trust these results? And so IBEX, by its very design from the beginning, has these two sensors, IBEX high and low, measuring two different energy ranges. But we overlap the energy ranges in a way that we were able to measure in the most important energy range, at about a kilovolt. We were able to measure independently with the two, uh, with the two uh, instruments. And so the graphic that we've put up now shows on the top the IBEX high sky map at 1 kilovolt, 1.1 kilovolts, and the IBEX low sky map at about a kilovolt. Very similar energies. And while there's much better statistics in the IBEX high sky map on top, clearly the ribbon is, is, is present, is in the same place, and has the same sort of characteristics as measured by IBEX low. So these measurements are completely independently confirmed by IBEX itself. And you're going to hear a little later in this press conference, they're also confirmed and, in fact, extended uh, with the Cassini observations, which Don will talk about shortly. So it would be shocking, shocking enough, if what we found was a ribbon that was tens of degrees wide, 10, 20 degrees wide. But it's even more shocking than that, because when we look with really high resolution, and IBEX has the, the sensitivity to really look at, at very, a very uh, narrow angular resolution, we actually see fine structure. And the graphic that we've put up here takes a piece of this ribbon south of the equator and, 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 and blows it up. And in addition, what we've done now is we've binned up the, the individual particles that we observe coming in in half degree bins, and we've summed those half degree bins until we get about 100 counts in a bin, which is good, a good statistical number. 
When you do that, what you see is the ribbon itself has got a lot of fine structure in it, that there are actually structures in there that are much brighter than the adjacent things that are only a degree or two or three degrees wide. That's really shocking when these things are coming from a region that's so large and so distributed. And nobody expected to see anything like that fine structure. So I just wanted to mention uh, there are a lot of other great results coming out of IBEX. We have five papers that are just coming out in science right now, posted online right now at this press conference, a sixth from the, from the Cassini measurements. They cover a lot of different areas. Um, I wanted to mention one more area for you, and that's the direct detection of interstellar neutrals. Um, in addition to these neutral atoms, which are created in the interaction region at the boundaries of the heliosphere, there are also very low energy neutrals that are just wandering into the heliosphere as we move through, uh, move through the galaxy. And previously, spacecraft observations had seen helium directly. Um, but with IBEX, we've now made and have just published the very first observations, direct observations of interstellar uh, helium, uh, sorry, hydrogen and oxygen in addition to observing helium. And in the graphic that's put up now, you can see those, those three. These are from the uh, low energy detector, IBEX low. And you can see these quite localized bright spots that are produced by the different species. And they come from the time when IBEX isn't exactly the right spot in the orbit that the particles coming in from the interstellar medium feel the force of gravity or bent around and come right into the aperture. And so it's yet another type of observation of this interaction that we're making. So with my final graphic, I, I want to answer the question, so what is this ribbon uh, and what does it mean? Uh, unfortunately, I can't answer that question because we don't know what this ribbon really is. We know some interesting things about it, though. Uh, as soon as we saw this and, you know, we're building up the sky maps week by week and we see this bright thing like, wow, what's that? You know, and it goes around and it starts to wind up and holy moly. So as we're looking at that and as it's building up, people start to say, what could it be? What could it correlate with? And we pretty quickly realized that the external magnetic field in the galaxy, the local part of the galaxy, uh, what's called the, uh, the local interstellar magnetic field, was oriented in just such a way that it seemed to organize th these data and, and, and correlate with the ribbon. And in the graphic that we've put up here, you can see the, the, the sort of a picture from the outside looking in. We've painted the ribbon and the, and the particle fluxes on this uh, boundary of the heliosphere. And then we put in the, 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 the expected orientation of the external magnetic field. And you can sort of think of that external magnetic field like a bunch of bungee cords. If you're pushing a beach ball through bungee cords, it kind of drapes around and pushes in on the beach ball, but it also, it also changes the shape of the bungee cords. And that's sort of what magnetic field lines are like. And so what you see here is the external magnetic field pushing in in the southern hemisphere of the, of the heliosphere and also pushing in and squeezing it from the sides. And just exactly where it's most bent and most draped around the outside is exactly where the ribbon is lying really a remarkable correlation and, and almost surely telling us that somehow this external magnetic field is really dominant, is playing a do, another dominant role in the interaction. But we don't understand the physical connection. We don't know why having an external field that, that drapes around that way and pushes on the outer boundary that way really produces these 200, 300 percent higher fluxes than the surrounding regions. And that's a, a really exciting and interesting part where we now have to go back and try to figure out what physics we're missing uh, in all our models and understanding. And so with that, I'd like to pass it over to Rosine Lelema, who's an expert in the environment uh, around our heliosphere. Thank you, Dave. Um, let's go, go back to the location of the sun in uh, our galaxy. And you may wonder whether such a galactic wind able to uh, stop the solar wind and confine it within our heliosphere is a common situation. And the answer is yes. And as you can see uh, in this movie showing the galaxy, the galaxy is rotating, but it is not rotating rigidly like a solid body. Instead, all the stars and the clouds of gas and dust, they are all moving with respect to each other. This is due to the constant recycling of the matter, stellar formation, explosion, etc. So th this is. This is, a, as a consequence, our sun is moving with respect to the ambient medium. Presently, uh, our star is crossing a very small uh, interstellar cloud, and this, is, it, this cloud is shaping our, our heliosphere. For the other stars, of course, they are also same structure, same types of structure. They are called astrospheres. And in this uh, picture here, you can see three nice examples of such astrospheres recently imaged by the best telescopes. And you can see from this